Hey, Anthony. There, there he is. Hey, guys. How are you? Not too bad yourself. Oh, good. Let me get my... What are you eating there? It's all my lunch in the screen. A little uh, <laughs> boulangerie. Have you ever been to boulangerie in Franklin Square? Absolutely. Up right there. So my go-to there is the number 12. Chicken salad, apple slices, raisins, walnuts. I'm pumping Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's nice. I go with the... I get a little turkey on French bread. They put a guacamole on it. It's, uh, they do a nice job. Yeah. Let's, let's ask the real question. How's the pool? Pool's great. Perfect summer for it. The other day they showed where we broke a record, like 40 some odd days of, of uh, above 80 or whatever it was. And I feel like we've had probably another 12 days or 20 days since. It's been, uh, it's been the one saving grace for this whole summer. We're headed to the Adirondacks uh, at the end of next week. That's the extent of our summer travel schedule. We rent a place on Fourth Lake, Rocky Point. It's beautiful up there. Yeah, we've been going there probably 30 years. Some hiking, and we've got a pontoon boat for two days. So and My parents were going there 50-some-odd years ago. My buddy got married there probably, I don't know, 15 years ago. It's just um, it's, it's a mainstay. You, I've always tinkered with the idea of uh, wanting like a little summer office up there. So I'll do like a little advertising in the old Forge newspaper um, for like to do trust planning for people with family camp property. We get calls every time that I do that. We actually, um, we bring my mom with us and she's very helpful with the, with the kids. And she's actually, um, she just retired from her job last Friday. We've always had a nanny and we kind of lost the nanny. So we're trying to scramble to figure out what to do with the kids. And my mom would come and like stay with us through the weekend and help with the kids. And she's like, well, what if I just moved in? And my wife was like, yeah, I actually, I'm actually good with this idea. So she's moving in Saturday. Yeah. We shall see. Awesome. We shall see. I haven't lived uh, with my mom since I was 18 years old. So how old are right. your kids? They are nine, six and two. So the two year old really is like requires constant maintenance constant supervision <laughs> yeah you know maintenance makes them sound like a honda <laughs> yeah yeah it's just like having a foreign car like you're just like forever <laughs> in the garage with them you know all right mike you want to get us kicked off here yeah sure so um anthony i think we first met a few weeks back we had a mobile meeting with joe Cavantino, and at the time i think we were all sweating bullets because it was pretty damn hot out yeah and yeah. it was it was good to just get to know you Briefly, you know, today's conversation is all about you being able to tell us your story. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself, but really what, what's going on? How's business? What's happening? Well, thanks for the opportunity. Always good to chat with you guys. We had a great time, even though it was oh God, one of those 90 degree days last time. So I'm a Syracuse guy, born and raised, uh, grew up here, went to CBA for high school, graduated from Lemoyne for college, and then couldn't get enough of the central New York higher ed scene so I went to Syracuse for law school law school was over and decided that instead of making money for the man I should go into business for myself and five years ago March we opened the doors of the Marone law firm at the time it was just myself and my baby brother Michael who did uh, well at that point he did whatever I told him to do uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not a lawyer, so he was kind of my gopher, and now he does all of our social media, digital media. And we've grown since that time. We're now a team of eight or nine of us, depending on the day. And um, we do estate planning, elder law, so a lot of wills, a lot of trusts, a lot of small business planning. Um, to kind of fast forward to how business is going now, before COVID, we had just had our five-year I still got the invitation on my desk, actually. We just had our five-year anniversary party at the Century Club, March 6th. It was like the week before COVID. It was the last thing anybody did. And, um, and lawyers were deemed non-essential the following week, which hurt a lot of our feelings. But uh, we retreated to working remotely for a, for a little while. So our whole firm went remote during the shutdown period. And we've been opened for business technically since May 27th with phase two. And I've been back at the office pretty much every day since then. We've got some folks still working remotely, but uh, a good percentage of us are here in the office. We've had clients come into the office. We're doing all of the masking, cleaning, hand sanitizing, giant plexiglass partition, 
things that we could do to keep everybody safe. Our clientele is primarily people who are vulnerable, the elderly and disabled. So we're especially conscious of needing to keep ourselves healthy and, and make sure that if we're doing any travel, it's to places that are you know as safe as possible. Now, probably more than usual, we're kind of all as a team tuned into what everybody's doing in their personal life, which has been an adjustment. But we've been trying to be super cautious, having clients come back in. We've done a lot of outdoor meetings this summer, kind of like you guys when we met. Um, we call them curbside meetings, where we have clients pull up right in front of our office and we'll come out and conduct the meeting. And they can stay in their nice air conditioned car and we're sweating under the sun. Uh, doing the meetings but that's actually been really great and we probably keep doing it except I think we all know that the weather in Syracuse is not going to hold out much longer for us so I don't really want to be doing a curbside meeting in a blizzard necessarily so we're making the move now to kind of bring more of our meetings back inside we've got a lot of space here and um, we've got the you know like the high capacity HEPA filters and all the plexiglass dividers that money can buy yeah so it's been it's been it's been good it's been uh kind of crazy march april and may were busy months but not great months for business we were doing a lot of activity but a lot i think a lot of people if they were going to do any planning or spending they were kind of in a wait and see pattern yeah. um, now that the court system has reopened and some of the legal side of things is getting back to businesses uh businesses unusual here um we've we're going full steam like we're cranking it out super busy way more than usual um, which i hope is good and i hope we can sustain it help clear something up for me you hear estate planning that's pretty easy to understand but you hear elder law and maybe maybe it's not as easy for everybody to understand what that is so put that in perspective yeah. would you so usually for me elder law is some kind of planning that's looking towards the future if i need some kind of medical intervention care for myself, care for a loved one, what does that look like? And statistically speaking, the AARP says that 55% of all Americans will require some kind of long-term care. So if I'm meeting with a husband and wife, it's a good bet that at some point, one of them is gonna need some kind of care. So for almost any married couple out there, at least having a conversation about this type of planning, uh, especially as you near retirement age becomes, I think, essential. Glad I asked. I was thinking there was a state planning, and then I was thinking the elder law was more of the elder abuse, um, taking advantage of, of yeah, you know, yeah. folks losing their, their faculties. There is a lot of that. Bureau House has this interesting relationship uh, contract that they have with the state of New York where they run what's called an enhanced multidisciplinary team. So, Bureau House is everybody in Syracuse, I think, kind of knows they do domestic violence, but they also do elder abuse and elder financial exploitation. So they put these teams together. They all have these teams and they're someone from Vera House, uh, someone from the sheriff's office, someone from the state police, forensic accountant, lawyer, district attorney, uh, other people that are involved with the elderly community, usually adult protective. And we get referred cases from the various you know, different communities and we sit and we'll review them as a team. So someone's getting exploited financially by their daughter and the daughter's taken two hundred thousand dollars from from the mom and the mom's incapacitated that comes to the team and we kind of troubleshoot you know is this a is this an arrest is this a, cr a criminal case is this something where there needs to be a lawsuit filed can adult protective services get involved so vera house runs these teams um so it is a lot of that actually you know but but not in my in my private practice, there is a lot of that kind of financial exploitation of seniors, but the way I kind of think of it is a, a more, it includes that plus some other things, um, specifically planning for protecting your money in case you need that kind of care. It's really cool to hear the backstory in an organization like that. I've never, you know, never had to be involved in that to understand that there's a, a group of professionals behind the scenes to help to make sure that that's the highest level. So that's pretty cool. I, I'd say there's now more recognition that this is a growing problem with seniors being exploited. Uh, right. It's not always family, like we'll have a fair number of scam type cases, either through people pretending to be contractors or, you know, real true, like the email scams that you'll see from a Nigerian prince. A lot of senior citizens fall victim to those kinds of things. 
you know, it takes up maybe a little more work to get there, but um, it's, it's, it's really interesting to kind of see, especially if someone's truly committing a crime against an elderly person, it's, it's rewarding to see justice being done. So often, you know, reading the newspaper or reading the internet, it just like feels like that's missing uh, in a lot of cases. And he, to see it actually happen, especially when they're going after a vulnerable population like the elderly, it, it's, it's nice that there's that kind of closure. Well, unfortunately, that it's a huge population too. You think about the boomers okay. being one boomers. of the largest yeah. demographics. Yeah. I mean, we're just yeah. going to have more and more folks that are in their 80s and 90s. So um, it's it's probably a really good niche to be in. Yeah, my wife my wife will tell you that um, I was in law school trying to figure out what to do because at the time I was involved in uh, a lot of trial trial work and like looking like I was going to be a trial some kind of trial attorney and do stuff in court. At the time, I was in my first year of law school, not, you know, didn't really have an idea of what I was going to do, what I was going to be when I grew up and somehow stumbled into elder law as an option. And first thing I did was look at the demographics. And at the time, this is mid 2000s, early 2000s, kind of knew basically if I timed my career, the last of the baby boom generation will be passing away or going into nursing home around the time Anthony would like to retire. That kind of pushed me, nudged me in that direction. And yeah, I think the the proof has been in the pudding. It's 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 a booming area. There's a lot of work to be done. We're a tight knit group of lawyers. So even though we might have cases against each other, we are uh, we are still all mostly friendly. So it's it's still kind of congenial, um, especially in a small town. I think that's important. We're not a Manhattan where you can be cutthroat every day all the time. And I just don't desire to, to practice law that way. So it, it, it's kind of an interesting little intersection of both doing some planning, which is a lot of behind the scenes work, but also going to court a decent amount of the time, and, and which is really like you got to be on stage and, and ready to go. But for the most part, we try to, rather than being, uh, uh, if you think about it, rather than being a broad horizon of services with a bunch of different people providing them, essentially everyone in our firm can do all of the things that we do. So, uh, so we try to stay in our lane of individuals and small businesses, especially as it relates to estate planning, business planning, you know, anything that's kind of in that yep. money financial wheelhouse and uh, go deep on it and try to be the best at that particular, in that particular niche. What's your favorite? What would you prefer to do if you had your choice every day, all day, what would you choose? Yeah, I had this conversation today. Um, we just hired somebody new and I said, if I could do the out, the long-term planning for folks to protect their assets, where we're planning in advance to protect in case they need nursing home care or long-term care, I would do just that all day, every day. Clients are always super happy because they get a real sense of value, right? They know, okay, I paid Marone a couple thousand bucks, but I've protected 400,000 or I've protected whatever that number is for it's usually yeah. really important things like their house, their camp, their savings. You know, there's a true sense of value there. Uh, so clients are usually satisfied. It's rewarding for the lawyer because you actually feel like you're, you know, protecting and preserving a nest egg for the family to pass on to, you know, whatever they're going to pass it on to the next generation. And it keeps it interesting. There's always a little, everybody's got a different family history. Everybody's got a different story. It's interesting enough where you're but you're not like i'm not beholden to some judge or some court system to tell me when i've got to be somewhere or where i've got to do it which i don't i don't love as a business owner yeah 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 so i would do that all day every day if i could you know at this point to grow the business and kind of establish ourselves doing what we do you've got to do a certain amount of the litigation and fighting that's just kind of what gets the name out there when you do this kind of work for example i'm um guardian for about 15 different individuals where these are adults who have become incapacitated in some way and they need help managing their money typically or managing their health care. That's rewarding because you're actually, you know, these are folks that probably don't have family to help them or the family's not qualified to do something like this. So it is, it is um, emotionally rewarding to be able to help people in that way. Yeah, in the storage industry, I run across a lot of that because it's sometimes yeah. people put their stuff in storage when they go into nursing homes or their families are managing that or it's somebody assigned kind of like yourself. I've kind of seen a whole variety of different scenarios like that.
Yeah, it yeah. keeps it interesting. I've had to, uh, God, we've had to clean out an apartment in Manhattan that someone had vacated. We've had probably 10 houses of various states of decay that we've had to go into, which is, you know, sometimes interesting, sometimes sad. Um, there was a property in the city of Auburn that was a, a very historic property uh, that they refer to as the Auburn Castle. Um, which had just been run down because this woman had, you know, couldn't take care of it, that we were able to sell to a developer and that they were able to restore to its prior um, grandeur. So, you know, for every sad story of somebody who's kind of suffered alone without the support to help them, there's a, there's a good story where we're able to kind of rectify the situation and, and maybe uh, salvage something for the family or restore. In that, in that case, it was kind of restoring the goodwill that her family had in the community as stewards of this uh, nationally registered historic property, which, you know, Auburn has some famous, um, famous citizens and famous uh, houses already there. So it was, it was good to be able to kind of put this one back on the map. Let's talk about marketing. Sure. I think what, I think what we saw is maybe you did some rebranding right when COVID was happening and yeah. That makes sense. It was maybe five years in. So um, talk us through what your branding was like before and what happened and when it happened and what's going on with it. Yeah. So we were approaching the five year deadline and or the five year anniversary. And we kind of thought um, that we had, you know, we enjoyed our logo. I don't know if you can even see it. I still got it on some of the swag. It's just like a normal M very law firm, you know, totally fine. Got us, got us where we needed to go for the first five years, but um, because of our investment in the community and involvement in the community, we just kind of wanted our, we kind of wanted the, the logo and the, the marketing to be more representative of, of our role in the community. So I worked with Tommy Lincoln from Stay Fresh, who does all of the marketing for Glazed and Confused and designs all of the cans for 1911, the Beacon Skiff hard cider. And we worked with him and his team to kind of make our logo a little bit more fun and representative of our position in the community. Uh, I wanted various elements of the city of Syracuse kind of tied in one place. What we ended up with was a kind of a fun little combination of a formerly known as Carrier Dome, the courthouse, some buildings downtown, and then the, the kind of the front piece of it is our, uh, our building, which has a unique roof structure here in downtown Syracuse, uh, all tied in as one logo. So there's a lot going on. So we, we, we kind of launched, we had a video that we uh, put together about, uh, you know, making the new logo and we launched it at our five-year party, which was March 6th, the week before we shut down for COVID. So we totally rebranded the, the, the logo. And we really, when we were sent home, we kind of doubled down on our marketing just to kind of keep things going. Um, came up with some new, we got some new technologies that we released to help people do their will called will builder. Yeah. So we've, you know, we've kind of doubled down on the marketing and the brand and pushing out the branding just to kind of stay top of mind with folks, because we know that first of all, we know the times are tough. So if you're going to spend your money somewhere, I've got to have someone's attention in order for them to do it. And, you know, we just, I've kind of always been of the impression that I, even though we're a law firm and, and some people have feelings about, uh, what a law firm should be doing from a marketing or advertising perspective. I still think that there's a way to do it tastefully, but have fun and not take ourselves too seriously. Um, even though we do serious work and, and we take that seriously, we can have a little bit of fun in our marketing and, and engage the community at the same time. So that's kind of our outlook on things. Yeah. Two things, not that I'm anybody that matters, but I pay attention to marketing. It's kind of a hobby of mine. So the reason I know of you, the reason we're having this conversation, um, I saw the, uh, the rebranding video. That's what got my attention. And then I saw someone else's connect, started kind of paying attention. To you. So I think that's a good thing to hear, right? If you're a guy that's- Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And the other thing for what it's worth, Mike and I have been doing these calls, you know, every week, every week and a half, every two weeks since um, this whole thing happened. So we talked to a lot of different business people and a lot of different companies and I give the highest marks in regard to respect or strategy to the ones that go, things sucked, 
and we doubled down and spent more money. When I hear business owners say that, you have you have my attention because you stopped and you thought about how to be strategic, um, both to help people, which you did a lot of, and the message you gave was not just where money was flown right into your pocket, it was actually consultative and it was, um, it was uh, touched with emotion, um, but also from a strategic point, um, a lot of people were ducking their head and hiding oh, yeah. to see what was gonna happen next and yeah. hope that it didn't hurt. The guys that stood up, guys and gals that stood up and kind of bobbed and weaved are the ones I think uh, that shows who they're gonna be for the future. So hats off to you. I think that show, says a lot about who you guys are. Thank you. So I, I always, I kind of said to the team throughout, like we're riding the rapids, right? There's good days, there's bad days, especially you remember those, it seems like a lifetime ago, but those <laughs> days in March and April when we're just getting crushed every day, Ryan McMahon's going out there and just reporting not great numbers for Onondaga County. And we're trying to, at the same time, tactfully tell people to do their will because they may die. You know, like it's a, it's a, it's a tightrope to walk, right? Like, hey, you need this, like my service is now more relevant probably than normal times. Yeah. But like, I'm not gonna, I, I can't cram that, I, I can't throw that in your face. Like there's no way really to tastefully suggest to you that do, you need to do your will because of this pandemic. You know what I mean? Uh, thought process entirely was, let's double down on the marketing, give value, even if we're giving it away for free, don't care at this point. People need help, help them where we can, especially business owners. Uh, a lot of the webinars and stuff that, that I put out during those months were totally free information. Um, just try to provide them with whatever they need to get from A to B. And I know that that, you know, just from historical experience doing this, that's going to pay off in the long run. I'd much rather give stuff away for free as frequently as I can, because I know that that will come back. In a smaller so, market like, uh, like Syracuse, I mean, you're, yeah, you're going yeah. to end up getting a paying client by yeah. helping a friend with, yep, yeah, absolutely. I did a ton of PPP applications. Don't, we put it together. We did all the paperwork, submitted it to the bank. We're supposed to get paid from the banks. I haven't seen a nickel from a bank and I don't know that I ever will. To me, it was just a question of this is the goodwill in the community and helping a fellow business owner is worth way more than the small pittance the federal government was going to pay for people to help process these applications. I think in the long run, which we're still kind of in this, but in the long run, it's going to pay dividends. It really already has. Um, just getting to meet folks like you guys who I you know, probably wouldn't have been in community with before um, if you hadn't seen my stuff on, on social media, it, it, it's definitely paid off for us. I just pictured your two-year-old in 30 years opening the mail and getting a check and going, what's this? <laughs> Dad's, Dad's gone. I'm taking the money. Yeah. It'll, more likely it's going to be one of those stupid unclaimed funds thing that you have to get at the state fair. You don't have to worry about that happening this year. Not this year, sadly. We went to the, uh, we did the state fair. My buddy owns the villa. And uh, so we've gone a couple times. We sponsored when they did. I don't know if you remember. Yep. They did that first weekend at the place on the corner of Erie back in April. We sponsored it. They had our stickers on every bag if you could get through. And we've gone back a few times. We did it this past weekend and kind of set up chairs um, in the orange in the orange lot and let the kids run around. They had a good time. It was fun. What are you gonna do with um, the logo with the with the domes, the dome shape changing? We're in talk to put the uh, what do they call it? The butch? I don't even know. Like a the crown or whatever you want. Crown. To call it. Yeah, they had a word for it. Is that um, we're in talks to rebrand our rebrand. Hopefully, it's gonna be a just a little co cosmetic tweak. I, I want to see what it looks like when it's all done first. Before I can't wait to see what it looks like. Um, and obviously, you told us before, you're a huge tailgater. So what's the status of SU football? Um, and what, what do you think is going to happen this fall, this winter? Do you have any insight on that? As it stands right now, tailgating's canceled no matter what. So they've already canceled the tailgates um, along with canceling the season tickets. So what they've, what they've said for football is, if you're if we're allowed to have anyone in the dome we're going to sell them in, as individual tickets kind of like what they'll do for a bowl game i can't imagine that they're that the governor's going to let people into the stadium i just I, hopefully it's on tv i kind of have the same feelings about basketball i think it'll be on tv i don't know that they're going to be able to do it these are kids i mean these are these are and they're not paid right we're dealing with all of the stuff at once unfortunately you've got racial struggle in this country. You've got 
COVID struggle, and now you've got the amateur athlete thing also coming full circle, right? So it's tough. I mean, and they're not in a bubble. Like at least the NBA has been able to pull off what they pulled off because they were able to lock it all down and have this very strict bubble. And obviously college is not going to be like that. We saw, you know, they had what, three or 400 kids uh, on the quad last week at SU. I, if it were me, because I, I saw someone ask this question and my kid were playing, I actually would want them to play rather than just be sitting in their dorm room. Like, I think that the rigors of college athletics are such that you're more likely to be kept honest as a young person by being a participant in a sport than you are sitting in your dorm room with your buddies. Right. Not to mention mental health issues. I mean, if they're not playing, yeah. if there's a lot of, you know, their whole life has been based around building that performance and now they can't yeah. do what they're supposed to do. Uh, that you know, a lot of mental stuff comes in that's not good for anyone. Yeah, I'm, so I'm okay with them playing if they have a rigorous testing protocol and we agree across the ACC that that's how it's going to go. You know, there's risk. There's risk to us. There's risk to me being in my office. There's risk to me going to the grocery store. Question is, how much risk can we tolerate? And if the kids want to play and they're agreeing to play and the coaches want to let them play and we have the appropriate testing, I think it's great. I, I don't know. Fans in the stadium, I think, is probably a bridge too far. I, I, I don't think that'll happen at this point. But and I, I think the more the um, the social side of it for the kids, whether you're a middle yeah. school kid, a high school kid, college kid, these um, these athletes, these young people need those outlets. They, they need to interact with people. And they need to realize what it takes to, to work hard and play hard and appreciate. And so, yeah, I'm worried. I'm worried about all the mental fallout that happens if these kids have to sit in their dorms for too much longer. You know, as long as the teams that we're facing are going to match our protocol, which you hope that there's some kind of agreement that they're going to do that, I don't know how much more you can mitigate the risk. Sadly, I think kicking the can to the spring, we may not be in a better place in the spring, like cold and flu season. We don't know what's going to happen. Right. Um, and I don't know that we'll have a vaccine by then. So. I'd hate to see these kids lose a year. We already lost the basketball tournament, and God, SU was supposed to have such a good lacrosse team this year. Right. We went, you know, and we lost that. Speaking of mental health, right? Uh, what are you going to do with yourself to make sure that you're not uh, fighting the mental health issue because you don't have tailgating or something different? Tailgating thing is going to be hard. You know, I see my brother. We work together. Him and I are big fans. We'll probably uh, tailgate at my house. I was going driveway. Think, yeah, we'll tailgate my driveway. I don't think we'll have... So my big thing is I get this gigantic auto made of ice, and then you can... And it's got two luges down it that you could do, like, an adult beverage shot through. And I don't think that that's going to happen. I mean, that's not sanitary in normal times. <laughs> I definitely think it's not sanitary now. Like, you don't want to be sharing a, what amounts to a beer funnel with somebody. Um, we'll still do the tailgate, I think. Support the team in any way we can. So yeah, I think we're excited to be back. I'm keeping myself busy. My COO and I are doing a half marathon training program uh, kind of together where we check in with each other. So we're keeping the mental health in check. Two oldest boys are going back to five day a week in-person school. So we're hopeful that that's gonna go well and everybody stays safe. So, you know, it's all a question of risk, which I guess as a lawyer, I'm kind of, we train ourselves to determine how much risk we can tolerate. Um, so I'm not doing things like I'm not. And buddies of mine wanted me to go to a and have a fantasy football draft at somebody's house and sign. And I'm like, you know, look, that's just for me. That's not going to be something I'm going to do right now. If we're going to go outside to dinner or something like that, I might be a little more comfortable. But I've got a lot of people that are that I'm responsible to. And as much as I'd love to do some of these indoor activities, um, just choosing not to do them for now. So. Anthony, I know we're, we're a little short on time uh, based on the, well, not short, but we're getting to, close to our ceiling. You're on all these different shows. You have all these different abilities to post and to say what it is about your business, but usually it's just about your business. Yeah. Is there anything you want to say about you, about what made you do this, about what makes you different, about a hobby you had, something you overcame, something that makes you you, that you just haven't had the chance to say, that thing that uh, makes, makes you you? My dad died when I was in college. So I've been on the other side. I had a brother who was 18. I had a brother who was 15. I've been on the other side of what I help people through. 
And I know that it is incredibly difficult and incredibly painful. So my whole professional life is designed to try to minimize that pain. It's gonna be, it's always hard to lose someone, but I try to do planning in a way that will protect people and guide them through that period so that even though they're struggling, even though they're, they're hurting, you know, we've got a plan in place to make sure that everything's gonna be okay. You know? So I think having been through that kind of struggle and that kind of loss, uh, as I was starting law school, really kind of, for me, solidified that this is this was going to be the profession, the way I would spend my professional life. You were the oldest brother? Yes. Yep. So going into college, you had to become dad and support mechanism for mom and freshman in law school. Yeah, it was uh, it was very challenging. There's no, like, I was working full time starting law school. There's no sugarcoating it. It was rough. It was... I was with my wife, but we weren't married yet. She was starting grad school. Um, it was tremendously stressful. It was challenging, but I think having kind of lived through it helps me maybe have empathy for, for my clients that are going through similar or related loss or struggle in a way that um, can kind of, even though I can't make all of the emotional side of things better, you relate you know, I, that's at least for me, I, I could feel, I, I felt what they're feeling. So I understand, like, a, believe me, been there, totally understand what you're going through. You don't need to shoulder it all alone. You know, here's the part of the burden that I can carry. And uh, we try to take that approach with everybody, uh, with all the folks that we deal with to make sure that, you know, we treat them like family. So I always say we're small on purpose and we want to treat our clients like, like we would treat our best family members. Not everybody asks that, it doesn't come up every day. Um, when I'm writing a sympathy card to a client, I will sometimes reference it depending on the situation, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely kind of made me who I am it, as it relates to my family and, and how I see my role. And, and, uh, you know, and then certainly anytime I hear about somebody losing their dad when they're young, it, it kind of it, it like sticks with you, you know? That, uh, that had the most power of anything you said today, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, you're going to say something? I'm sorry. I was just going to, I don't want to take his moment, but I was 16. I was the youngest of three when my dad died. Yeah. So hats off so to you. I, uh, yeah. you know, my siblings were older and we were on a different phase, but yeah. Your little brother who was 15 at the time, I, I immediately went there. Yeah. I don't know who he was. I don't know if that's Michael or yeah. another brother, but. Yeah, Michael, my brother Mike. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, because of that, we're super tight. We're all, you know, very close knit, you know, it's, and we were all in different phases. I was off to do my thing at law school. My brother was starting college and the one was still in high school. So it was like, you know, three teenagers, but all kinds of in, in, in different places. So we couldn't all be physically together. Um, yeah, it's, I don't wish it upon anybody. You know, it's, it's hard to lose a parent or a loved one at any point. And to me, the only thing that will probably be worse is losing a child as an adult, right? Like once you have kids, you kind of put a lot of value on that, but it, it, it changes your relationship with other people and it changes the way that you view yourself, I think as a parent, because you realize that time can be limited. And so you want to, you know, like I want to suck up every moment of summer with my boys. Like, I don't know how, how much time I'm going to have. So yeah, it definitely gives you a, a perspective that maybe you didn't want, but, um, uh, I think it, it is helpful to have that armor, you know. So we've had all of about uh, 49, 50 minutes of conversation in our whole life together, right? The vulnerability that you just went into, it made me understand who you were at a much deeper level. If, that, if it's advice, if it's a, I can cut this out if you want, but man, if you lead with that a little bit more, it gets to the, the, the real uh, root of who someone is and what they're made of. And, let me tie it back to what you do. That speaks in like, tremendous volume. So I hate to bring something so emotionally to something so strategically, yeah, 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 but yeah. they're hand in hand, my friend. People yeah. buy who they trust. And in your business, um, you're in a business where you gotta get that trust established quickly. Yeah, quick, yeah. I'm thinking you go to that first, but you went there with me and it took us in a whole different understanding of who you were and uh, I like it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate the feedback. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you coming on and uh, sharing that part of your story. Thanks. Yeah. Happy to do it. Cool.
Mike, I'll let you close on your end. I, I, I really enjoyed a conversation. I feel like we covered a lot of ground and um, I'm super happy for you. Um, I don't really know you, but I feel like I know you a lot more now and, and uh, I like your story. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Anthony. Nice to see you. Appreciate your Take time. Take care, guys. Bye. Be good.